the reason that we have more women in our treatment centers is because of the work of Dr. Philip. So we can give her a great deal of credit for her pioneering work in, uh, with respect to the underpinnings and the scientific basis for the work we do uh, for women and girls with blood disorders. And I'd like to thank you, the hemophilia treaters of this region, for inviting me to speak. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Barbara Conkle for willing to be on the program with me, especially since she's been on the programs with me in the past and is still willing to do it again. <laughs> especially after some of the questions we've had from the audience in the past, like the ones about the home births. Okay, now. Okay, there's usually a little thing down in the corner. Oh, there it is, down the left. This is the old version. Second row. There we go. No, I don't want this guy. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the obstetric management of women with bleeding disorders from the obstetrician's perspective. But I'm somewhat biased because I've had experience in the hematologic arena, so I think that will come through. With, by way of disclosures, I do receive research funding and honoraria from CSL bearing, um, but I don't think uh, much of that uh, pertains to this talk. There are obstetrical manifestations of bleeding disorders that are probably familiar to many of you in this room. Women with bleeding disorders actually, some of them may be at a greater risk of miscarriage. We don't have a great deal of data. I will uh, share with you what we do know. They may be at a greater risk of bleeding complications during pregnancy, particularly around the time of childbirth. They may be more likely to experience postpartum hemorrhage, but are definitely more likely to experience delayed postpartum hemorrhage, and we'll talk about that. They are more likely to experience vaginal or vulvar hematomas, vaginal delivery. And they may have some difficulty when they try to get pregnant because they have to come off of their uh, hormonal uh, contraceptives, which in many cases they've used to manage their heavy menstrual bleeding. In fact, that's our first line of therapy for managing heavy menstrual bleeding in women either with or without uh, an underlying bleeding disorder. Now these, these data are from a case control study that was done uh, through hemophilia treatment centers. Maybe some of you actually participated in it. Uh, that was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control. Now, these uh, responses are inflated because these are self-reported data, but you can see, and I could show you, if I could find a pointer here. Okay. So this is where I take the pointer and aim it at myself. Well, I have it highlighted here. But even though these data may be inflated, you can see the trend that the women who had von Willebrand disease uh, were much more likely to report a history of menorrhagia than were match controls. And these, the controls were matched for age, uh, socioeconomic uh, status, and parity. So uh, this is, uh, some of you may even have heard me uh, relate this anecdote. I had a woman come to me with a bleeding disorder who had had difficulty getting pregnant for two years. Uh, she'd been married for two years and uh, she and her husband wanted to have a family from the time that they got married and she had been unsuccessful. And I took a careful history and I looked over her medications and I said, well, you might want to stop taking the birth control pills. <laughs> so, she said, but I'm not taking them for that reason. <laughs> well, the pills don't know. So, uh, but it illustrates the point that many women are dependent on combined hormonal contraception to uh, re reduce uh, the lining of the uh, uterus, to reduce heavy menstrual bleeding, 
And in fact, in the last uh, couple months, uh, the first birth control pill has now gotten uh, FDA approval for uh, the indication of heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, it's a pill by Bayer. Um, I don't get any funding for Bayer. But uh, there is now one that has gone through all the clinical trials and, and what we have all known and inferred for years has actually been clinically demonstrated with this particular pill they've gone through all the uh, FDA trials to get approval for uh, its use. But uh, needless to say, that is uh, very difficult to get pregnant on, on combined hormonal contraception. And, and so the armamentarium is limited uh, to now, though we have lice data, uh, and women can use uh, that uh, if they need to control heavy menstrual bleeding, or uh, they can use if they have von Willebrand disease or some responsive platelet defects, or if they have, uh, or if they have hemophilia carriage, they may be responsive to DDAVP, and we may be able to use that. Uh, simultaneously, uh, women are also at risk of having uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts or bleeding with ovulation, and that may make it difficult for them to become pregnant if they have a tendency toward these uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts with ovulation. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, coming off of combined hormonal contraceptives, we may have to consider alternatives like uh, fibrin antifibrinolytics or uh, DDAVP in some of these women as they uh, anticipate pregnancy. And, the patient who changed my life was a woman who had been a patient of Dr. Harold Roberts. Maybe some of you in this room know Dr. Harold Roberts. He was at uh, UNC for years. He's one of the founders of the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. He's been a hemophilia treater forever. Uh, he had a patient uh, that he brought to UNC when I was an OBGYN resident there. She had congenital deficiency of factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. And, and we were responsible for getting her safely through delivery. And it was her particular case that uh, compelled my interest in women with bleeding disorders. But when she was a teenager, she stopped taking her super therapeutic doses of vitamin K. Uh, and she took vitamin K to bring her factor uh, 2, 7, 9, and 10 levels, which were extremely low into a range of somewhere between 1 and 15 percent. Well, teenagers, as you know, don't have to take their uh, insulin, factor, yeah. <laughs> whatever. So she stopped taking her vitamin K. She ovulated one time, uh, had a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst that, and hemorrhaged into her retroperitoneum as, with ovulation and wind up, wound up having to be admitted to the hospital and being transfused 17 units. So even this little tiny rent in the ovary in a woman with a bleeding disorder, which can actually result in severe hemorrhage, and may be a reason why a woman with uh, a severe type 3 von Willebrand disease, or Dr. Conkle and I were talking before we began this presentation, the occasional patient with the extremely rare bone eating disorder like type 1, uh, Lansman's thrombocytopenia, as well as other reasons uh, with that condition like the alumine thrombocytopenia and the newborn or the neonate um, may actually have an absolute contraindication to pregnancy. And then there are other bleeding disorders uh, where these, besides von Willebrand disease, where uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts have been reported, like hemophilia carriage, a fibrinogenemia, factor 10 deficiency, factor 13 deficiency, and as I mentioned, platelet defect. So, even before we get to pregnancy, we may have issues we need to consider. Uh, I'll touch on them again later. Now, uh, there aren't a lot of data in our literature about endometriosis, but if you've taken care of women with bleeding disorders, you may find that they are at an increased risk of endometriosis. And what is endometriosis? It's where the lining of the uterus uh, grows um, outside of the uterus. And women with bleeding disorders uh, seem to be at an increased risk of this condition. It certainly can occur in women without bleeding disorders, but a risk factor for this condition is heavy menstrual bleeding, and certainly our patients have uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, 
and the theory is that it results from efflux of menstrual blood uh, that carries endometrial cells into the abdominal cavity and then they implant and then with menstrual cycles uh, they bleed. So uh, it's not exactly clear uh, why we would have this increased prevalence of endometriosis in women with bleeding disorders, but maybe it's because of their heavier menses, maybe they bleed more from these endometrial implants when they get them, uh, or maybe they're more likely to be misdiagnosed because they have more pain with their periods, they have, and they're more likely to go do that. Uh, so they're more likely to have a lab for a scopic, a diagnostic laparoscopic procedure. But one of the uh, problems with endometriosis is that it's associated with infertility and increased difficulty getting pregnant. So it's, every now and then we see a woman with a bleeding disorder where we're also working around uh, endometriosis. Now there are uh, changes in the clotting factors and Dr. Conkle is going to go uh, talk about these in uh, much more detail, uh, but they do work to uh, the advantage of the pregnant woman with a bleeding disorder. Uh, factor eight von Willebrand increase, uh, factor nine does not, but that does have implications uh, for pregnancy, but like I said, Dr. Conkle's gonna talk about that in more detail. Uh, but it may be why once the woman gets pregnant that we see as few a complications as we do. Uh, the, and it could be that in women with bleeding disorders, those blood vessels are wide open and the placenta is particularly well nourished if the woman doesn't have um, experienced hemorrhage. Then we only have small series of uh, miscarriages in women with bleeding disorders. Um, and in general, these may look like high rates but the background rate of miscarriage is 15%. So it's hard to say from these rates in these series that women with bleeding disorders have a higher rate of miscarriage than the general population. Uh, or I should say in these women with von Willebrand disease. These, these series are just in von Willebrand disease. These are reports of miscarriage in women with other bleeding disorders. And these two look similar to the general population, except for women with fibrinogen deficiency and women with factor 13. And these women are at a remarkably increased uh, risk of having uh, pregnancy loss. And it appears that uh, fibrinogen and its cofactor, factor 13, which is necessary for cross-linking of the fibrinogen fibers are essential for normal platelet adherence on the uterus. So uh, when we encounter these women, uh, we have to think about uh, fibrinogen replacement or now uh, that factor 13 concentrates are available, we have to think about factor 13 replacement. Now, uh, what we fear the most, though, is the big bleeding challenge at the time of childbirth. Uh, interestingly, in, in a series of over 50 women uh, in uh, Sweden uh, in the 1970s, uh, there wasn't a significant difference in women who were uh, moderate to lose severely affected with von Willebrand disease compared to controls. In a retrospective study of where patients reported whether they had hemorrhage or not, uh, Dr. Kweedy's found an increase in cases compared to controls. And when uh, we looked at data from discharge summaries for the entire United States, uh, we found an increased rate in women with von Willebrand disease, an increased rate of postpartum hemorrhage, that is, in women with von Willebrand disease compared to controls, but not so high of a rate that you would ever talk the woman out of getting pregnant. This is not a remarkably increased rate compared to this. I mean, that's a risk you would be willing to take. So in general, we certainly don't discourage women with garden variety von Willebrand disease from becoming pregnant. And these are uh, data uh, from all of the United Kingdom. Uh, 
that were published in the British Journal of OBGYN found an odds ratio for postpartum hemorrhage. They found that von, at least reported von Willebrand disease was a risk factor, a threefold risk factor for postpartum hemorrhage. Moderate, but not tremendously increased risk. Now, uh, this is a vulvar hematoma. It's something that we don't see all that often. We only see in about two in every thousand deliveries. But it does carry some morbidity and increase, certainly carries pain uh, <clears throat> with it. But it is something that we see in much greater frequency in women who have von Willebrand disease. We see it in one in 13 deliveries, one in 37 deliveries in hemophilia carries. And in another series published by uh, Raison Kadir, uh, it was reported in three of 49 deliveries. In fact, now at our institution, when we, we started with the converse, when we see a woman who has a vulvar or vaginal hematoma, we start looking for a bleeding disorder. And what seems particularly pathognomonic of postpart of uh, von Willebrand disease and other bleeding disorders is not the immediate hemorrhage that is associated or is met controlled by the uterus. The uterus itself is responsible for contracting uh, and uh, clamping off those open blood vessels that are left behind after the placenta comes out. And sutures are responsible for sewing up those lacerations and incisions that we make. But we have to rely on clotting factors and platelets to take care of those small nicks and, and open sites inside the uterus, that oozing. So it stands to reason that women with bleeding disorders platelet dysfunction are at particularly increased risk of delayed postpartum hemorrhage, where hemostasis really matters. And in fact, that's uh, been borne out in the literature, where uh, uh, in a series by Ramsehoy uh, found that in these 24 deliveries of 13 women with von Willebrand disease, 25% of these women reported von Willebrand, or excuse me, reported delayed postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, in these 54 deliveries, 20% uh, of the women reported delayed postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, and this wasn't necessarily physician qualified or these patients didn't necessarily require transfusion or anything, but the women themselves reported these rates. Uh, in these 25 deliveries, 24% of the women reported uh, delayed postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, in these 25 deliveries of women with factor 11 deficiency, 11% in these 46 hemophilia carriers and 2% in these um, 43 deliveries in uh, 23 hemophilia carriers. I need to let you know that the expected rate of delayed postpartum hemorrhage is about 1%. Uh, we just pulled all the cases of postpartum hemorrhage that we had at our institution for the last five years and out of those uh, 15,000 deliveries we only had five delayed postpartum hemorrhages. And um, we looked at, and then we cross-referenced it by pulling all the cases of where a woman who was within six weeks of delivery got a transfusion. And we turned up an extra case, and we got excited that we found one that didn't, hadn't previously met our criteria, but she'd fallen and fractured her hip when she was three weeks postpartum, and she'd gotten transfused, but it wasn't a postpartum hemorrhage. <laughs> so, uh, in general, uh, the, uh, there are increased rates of uh, bleeding during pregnancy, after delivery, and perineal hematoma. And in this uh, study we did looking at discharges, there was a tenfold increased risk of bleeding during pregnancy, a 50% increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage, and a threefold increased risk of perineal hematoma. So what do we do about it? How do we manage pregnancies uh, differently? Well, there are obstetric issues related to potential maternal bleeding that we need to take into account, and there are obstetrics issues related to potential fetal uh, bleeding and, and possible inherited fetal bleeding disorder that we need to take into account. 
So, uh, as I uh, let off, uh, we are in a position where we need to manage heavy menstrual bleeding and ovulation without oral contraceptives. It's very difficult to get pregnant, not impossible, while using oral contraceptives. Um, in my line of work, we actually see it happen, <clears throat> maybe one to two percent of the time, but it's harder. Uh, Uh, we need to inform uh, women and their families of the increased bleeding risk with pregnancy, especially the increased risk of delayed postpartum hemorrhage, and we need to be prepared for it. Because there's a slightly increased risk of uh, bleeding, and because our patients should have all of their vaccinations anyway, ideally they should be vaccinated against uh, potential uh, blood pathogens, including hepatitis A and B. Uh, we should offer a visit with a genetic counselor or other person who's knowledgeable in the transmission of uh, inherited conditions. If we're anticipating a potentially affected child, we should offer a visit with a pediatric hematologist. And obviously, we as the obstetrician should be coordinating the care with the hemostasis expert for the hemophilia treatment center. Now, fetal issues at the time of preconception counseling are related to the potentially affected fetus. They include genetic counseling, and it's specific depending on the inheritance and the particular condition that the uh, child may have. Uh, and like I said, we may want to refer the child to the pediatric hematologist. And we will want to involve all the requisite disciplines. And uh, it's not too soon to begin to think about the appropriate medical center. And we want that place to be a place where there's a blood bank, a pharmacy, and the laboratory support. During pregnancy, uh, we want, we will allow the woman with factor levels in the normal range, i.e. the range that would be normal if she weren't pregnant, and Dr. Conkle will talk more about what those levels may be, to receive care and deliver in the community. But for women uh, whose levels would not be considered normal, we want her to have management of pregnancy related issues like miscarriage, termination of pregnancy, childbirth, and other procedures uh, in a place where she ha there is a hemostasis expert. And usually that's going to be a center that is operating in conjunction with a hemophilia treatment center. And those patients who are going to need that kind of care are the patient with type 3 von Willebrand disease, type 2 von Willebrand disease, type 1 von Willebrand disease with a history of hemorrhage, or type 1 von Willebrand disease whose uh, levels are not in what we would consider a normal range if she weren't pregnant. That's usually about 50%. Or other bleeding disorders with factored levels that are outside the normal range. And then, as we would like all of this care to occur in partnership with a specialist in high-risk obstetrics. And what does the actual care consist of? Well, checking factor levels during pregnancy and again in the third trimester. Then if some of these women uh, require actual invasive procedures, if her levels aren't normal, then we want her to receive prophylaxis prior to these invasive procedures. And what might those procedures be? Well, egg retrieval if she's undergoing assisted reproductive technologies. Uh, chorionic villus sampling uh, in the first trimester or amniocentesis in the second trimester, cervical cerclage if she has a history of uh, incompetent cervix, uh, and the anesthesiologist has to be comfortable and agree to uh, what uh, has to be on the same page with respect to what the acceptable level of fact, uh, what the acceptable factor level is going to be before placement of a regional block. We have our 
levels that our uh, anesthesiologists have agreed to at our institution, which are generally a level of at least 50% before they'll place a, a neuroaxial block. And then uh, Dr. Conkle will talk about the plan for factory placement at the time of delivery. And we generally don't use uh, uh, DDAVP or desmopressin because of the amount of fluid that a woman uh, is replaced with at the time of delivery. And then Dr. Conkle will also talk about uh, clotting factor concentrates and of course virally inactivated or recombinant clotting factor should be used whenever possible as opposed to fresh frozen plasma or cryo precipitate. Now, we as obstetrician gynecologists or nurse midwives who are delivering babies assume that every woman is going to have a postpartum hemorrhage. 4% of women in this country do have a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, a little under 1% require transfusion. And we are prepared for that. Every woman has uh, intravenous access at the time of delivery, except a few who sneak through without it. And each woman gets prophylactic oxytocin, the natural hormone that stimulates uterine contractions, and we actively manage the third stage of labor. That's the stage of labor from the time the baby is born until the placenta is delivered. That's the, uh, the after the uh, placenta comes out, there, the ends of the uterine uh, arteries are left open in a space about the size of the placenta in uh, the uterus. Uh, when a woman is not pregnant, only about 1% of her blood flows through the uterus in any given minute. When a woman at the end of pregnancy, about 3 quarters of a liter or 750 milliliters goes through the uterus every minute. Um, 3 quarters of a quart. No amount of clotting factors or platelets can stem that tide. We need a powerful organ that can compress those vessels, and it happens to be the uterus. Uh, and the, the muscle of the uterus itself clamps off those open blood vessels, and simultaneously the blood vessels within the uterus are uh, constricting. And the combination of vasoconstriction and uterine compression on those vessels uh, stems the tide. Uh, the woman with two fact deficiency of factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, uh, who I, of Dr. Roberts, who I took care of when I was a uh, resident physician at Chapel Hill, uh, after she delivered her baby, her uterus contracted and she had almost no bleeding from her uterus, despite the fact that she had no, basically no. <coughs> two, seven, nine, and 10. What she did do is she had a nine pound, 12 ounce baby and I had to cut an episiotomy to make room for it and then she tried to bleed to death from her episiotomy. <laughs> and it took three units of FFP before the tide was ever stemmed. But the uterus itself is very powerful in, uh, in controlling blood loss. And so our job as obstetrician and gynecologists is to manipulate the uterus, make it contract and control what we term obstetrical bleeding. The other thing we're responsible for managing is uh, all this surgical bleeding, uh, repairing the uterus if we do a cesarean delivery, repairing uh, the wound if we do a cesarean delivery, repairing the episiotomy or lacerations or uh, tears in the vagina uh, associated uh, with the delivery uh, and uh, leave the plan for the hemostatic management up to the treatment center or the hemostasis expert. And like I said, um, we uh, rely on uh, oxytocin uh, routinely uh, in every delivery uh, to help stimulate the uterus. If that fails, our second line now is a synthetic prostaglandin called mesoprostol, and then uh, another prostaglandin we use is called uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha, the brand name is called hemabate. Um, and then uh, we use a ergot-derived uh, vasoconstrictor called methogen. So we have a few uh, things that we have up our sleeve to help stimulate the uterus and to contract, as well as all the uh, and then mechanical things to sort of stimulate the uterus to contract, like massage, physically compressing the uterus, or if we have the abdomen open, 
We can weave sutures through the uterus to help it uh, constrict, or uh, we can put a balloon in it and actually tampon off the uterus. So use a variety of things to uh, make the uterus contract, compress it, tampon on it, um, and like I say, uh, ligatures to uh, manage the surgical aspects. So postpartum women bleed for a median number of 20 to 27 days after delivery. And what we have learned is factor levels remain elevated for only, well, I think we're learning from our uh, research, maybe not even 14 to 21 days, or down after about seven to 14 days. So women are vulnerable to hemorrhage after those factor levels fall. Dr. Hank Roquet, when he was at New York University, collected all the cases he could find in the published literature of postpartum hemorrhage in women with von Willebrand disease and found that the average day of hemorrhage was day 15. Yet we typically only provide prophylaxis for three to five days postpartum, which may not be sufficient, and more data are required. In fact, we're studying that now. These are data from a study we are doing, and it's a preliminary data from a study we're doing in uh, women with von Willebrand disease, looking at postpartum level, levels of von Willebrand factor postpartum, and we're also looking at uh, blood loss in these women. But it's actually reassuring. This includes, uh, the, the cases include treated and untreated women, and uh, we are tending to treat women longer and it looks like we may be doing something good because we seem to be having uh, uh, about the same amount of bleeding in the women who are treated and untreated until we get, this is about when we stop, and then looks like then we begin to have more bleeding in the cases than the controls. Now what if uh, women actually begin to hemorrhage? Uh, this is this is not the baby back here. This is the uterus. It weighed 13 pounds, 4 ounces. I had to call one of my colleagues who was a pelvic surgeon to help me, and uh, does just gynecology to help me get this uterus out, which is a whopping uterus. And I'm sorry I didn't get a picture of the floor. But um, <laughs> we use oxytocin, as I said, to help contract the uterus. We use surgical interventions like repair incisions and lacerations like eight vessels. Uh, and then we empty the uterus, tampon off the uterus, remove the uterus, and mentioned that before we have to. And then we look to Dr. Conkle and Dr. Uh, Philip and her colleagues to guide us regarding uh, blood component therapy and hemostatic therapy. Uh, and then uh, the double whammy is some of these women are at risk of delivering a potentially affected neonate. Uh, now, even if the baby's even mildly affected, we would like to avoid a fetal scalp electrode or fetal scalp sampling, which we never do anymore anyway. Uh, and delivery should be accomplished by the least traumatic method possible. Uh, and because of the increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, operative vaginal delivery uh, should be avoided. But especially in the, <coughs> when we're anticipating uh, an infant who's affected with severe hemophilia, since the need for operative vaginal delivery cannot be predicted in advance, a plan for cesarean delivery should be considered uh, sooner rather than later, like even before labor. And then umbilical cord blood should be attained at the time of delivery and have been needing they attested early. Uh, and the reason to avoid the electrode or the scalp sample is they actually uh, invade the integument of the fetus. And this is the problem with human babies. These are just too darn big. <laughs> this is the relationship of the chimpanzee. So anybody who says, well, you know, my cat gave birth, she didn't have a midwife or an obstetrician. Well, this is the chimpanzee who's a primate, not even a cat. And look at how much space there is. This is a chimpanzee head, and this is the chimpanzee pelvis. <laughs> 
<laughs> and this is Australopithecus, which is a lot closer to us than the chimpanzee. And this is a baby I recently delivered. I mean, just look at this. We're lucky any of us got out. <laughs> And for those of us who actually deliver babies, there's this point that is basically a point of no return. The baby gets so far down in the pelvis that it, it is extremely traumatic to try to push the baby up and deliver the baby through the abdomen. You get the baby far down, and if the baby experiences fetal distress, we're in a position where we've got to get the baby out and the most expeditious way is through the vagina, and if the baby's having distress, the most quickest way to get it out is to either apply a vacuum or a forceps. And one of the things about babies born to women with bleeding disorders is I swear that they have better perfusion of their placentas, than, certainly than women with clotting disorders who tend to have small, growth-restricted babies. Babies born to women with bleeding disorders, and this hasn't been well studied, but they seem to have placentas that are very well perfused, and they grow to be eight and a half, nine pounds. And so we had a woman, re well, just in the last month or two, uh, she didn't realize that she was a hemophilia carrier, and she had a nine pound baby, and uh, her baby got low in the pelvis, and her um, obstetrician put the vacuum on, and then so then he pulled, and then she, the baby came out and had a huge hematoma. Fortunately, it was just extracranial rather than, it was just extracranial rather than intracranial because then there aren't the same implications for uh, the fetal brain. But, um, uh, he became severely jaundiced from this blood that uh, had to be resorbed, and he got transferred to his hosp our hospital. Oh, and by the way, his circumcision wouldn't stop bleeding. <laughs> so uh, there are uh, risk of serious birth injury in term infants. Uh, due to vaginal delivery from other conditions for which we have stopped doing vaginal deliveries, like breach, uh, where the relative risk of uh, serious injury is threefold increase, increase three times, um, or in previous <coughs> C-section, where we tend to prefer, a, or frequently tend to prefer a repeat C-section, or the second twin where the risk is increased threefold. But in hemophilia, the risk to the baby is increased eightfold. So it's a situation where we should have no compunction about going ahead and just electively delivering the baby by C-section. And we were much more cautious about recommending a cesarean back in the 60s or 70s when the most of our babies were born vaginally, and the C-section was the exception. But now, uh, the, the, the ratio between operative vaginal delivery, forceps, and vacuum versus C-section has changed. Now we rarely do forceps, rarely do forceps and vacuum delivery, and would much rather deliver a baby by C-section than forceps or vacuum. We this here back in the 70s, forceps and vacuum rarely did a C-section. Now, rarely do forceps and vacuum, but you much rather do a C-section. And that has to be infinitely <laughs> true when we have a baby affected with hemophilia. One of the arguments is, well, why would we want to subject a woman who may have low factor eight level to uh, surgery? Isn't surgery associated with increased risks? Well, yes, but particularly if a woman's labored first 
we have one randomized trial in the world of vaginal delivery versus C-section, and it was in a randomized trial done in women who had breech presentation. And in point of fact, uh, when, when women are randomized to one or the other, um, then this group of planned vaginal deliveries also includes all the people who wound up with a C-section that had failed vaginal delivery, and the rate of complications actually turns out to be just about the same between the two groups, so uh, including bleeding and infection and wound complications. So uh, the, the, when we counsel women about vaginal delivery versus serine, we say, yes, the best thing is this is for women who don't have a baby with hemophilia. And we're just talking about the average woman in general. We say the best thing is to have a baby to just come easily out your vagina. And the worst thing is to have a long labor and then wind up with a C-section. Uh, the intermediate risk situation is a planned cesarean. And so that's not an unreasonable thing for a woman who has a baby, a baby affected with hemophilia. The risk to her is, is not sufficient, is not uh, unreasonable to have a planned cesarean. And I'm not opposed to vaginal deliveries. I started my career as a midwife, but now I have no compunction in a woman who has a, an affected baby to proceed with a cesarean delivery. And, uh, Fact, this is uh, these are our recommendations in our our new MASAC guidelines for the infant affected, the potentially or excuse me the carrier expecting an affected infant. <coughs> Recommend that while the majority of affected infants of hemophilia carriers can be safely delivered vaginally, the outcome of labor cannot be predicted, and a spontaneous vaginal delivery cannot be guaranteed. So, a planned vaginal delivery puts a woman at risk of an abnormal labor and vacuum or forceps delivery, predisposing the infant to intracranial hemorrhage. And the risk can nearly be eliminated by, by performing an elective cesarean delivery before labor. Uh, and vaginal delivery does not eliminate the bleeding risk to the hemophilia carrier. So, just a cute. <laughs> so in summary, I hope I've um, made you aware of the obstetrical manifestations of bleeding disorders at the time of childbirth. Uh, the preparation for childbirth, both in terms of preconception, consultation, and genetic counseling, uh, and how we uh, prepare for childbirth during prenatal care, what we can do to prevent maternal bleeding complications, and what we can do to prevent uh, fetal bleeding complications. So, uh, and I uh, obviously the optimal care of women with bleeding disorders will be achieved in centers uh, like these where there is collaboration between hematologists and knowledgeable obstetrician and gynecologists. Thank you.